Hello and welcome to Keeping It Real Pod, the only podcast for real estate brokers made by real estate brokers. My name is DJ Paris. I'm your host through the show and thank you for tuning in. This is our second episode and in case you missed the first, I want to quickly explain what this podcast is all about. So I work at a real estate firm here in Chicago. We have hundreds of brokers. Uh, Many brokers who join us are brand new and so one of the biggest questions our support and training team receive when in particular new brokers come on board is, hey, what are the veteran brokers doing? What are the most successful agents at your firm doing? So over the years, we've interviewed them and we obviously um, ask them what they're doing to become successful, what's worked for them, what advice they have for newcomers, etc. And then sort of occurred to us, well, why are we limiting it to just our own brokers? There's 40,000 brokers in Chicago and obviously hundreds of thousands of more across the country. So we decided to open this up to everyone. So the idea here is that every week we're going to be bringing you an interview with a real estate broker who's doing something we think particularly interesting and maybe could help everyone else uh, learn more about how to become more successful in their own real estate practice. So that's it. And if you'd like to be featured as a guest or or you have an idea of somebody that you think would be um, a good interview, you can visit our website at keepingitrealpod.com. Uh, And you can send us a message there. Also, if you wanted to sponsor one of the episodes, you can do that there as well. Today on the show, we have Matir Patel, who is a a real estate broker here in Chicago. And a little bit about him, he has a background in finance, but he himself has been a real estate investment uh, investor for 15 years. In fact, his parents were doing it even before that. So what he specializes in is helping people transition to real estate investments. Uh, He's been doing that for over five years. He specializes specifically in multi-unit added value plays. So for example, converting multifamily into single family in very specific neighborhoods. Uh, We talked a lot about how he uh, got invested, started investments, how he finds investors, how he finds properties, how he puts deals together, and why he chooses to do that more so than traditional realtor stuff. And uh, it's really Really interesting. I think you're going to love it, and we really appreciate Matir being on the show. So, let's get started. So we're here today with Matir Patel. Uh, Matir, we thought would be particularly interesting and fun to talk to for the show because of his particular niche that is more uh, unusual or, or rare for brokers that I've met. Uh, so thanks, Matir, for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me here, DJ. Um, yeah, thanks. And so tell us a little bit about how did you how did you get started in real estate? So my father was a passive real estate investor some 30 years ago, and I watched as his business grew, and it became a supplemental income to the point where it surpassed his income as a scientist. So he was a buy and hold. Buy and hold. Out. In the early 80s, Reagan had a way for you to take your depreciation and mitigate your taxes. And obviously after the SNL crisis and everything, they removed that deduction and it no longer holds true. That being said, he invested in real estate and he found that it, you know, it was a passive way to generate significant income and over the life of the loan, you know, you have something real. And it became his primary source of income? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Did he end up doing that full time or did he still continue as a chemist? Or? Uh, he retired at 50. And wow. then uh, now he plays with his grandkids and uh, collects rent every month. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Was it here in Chicago? In or? Chicago. Uh, the north side and the northwest suburbs. Is that where you grew up as well? Or? I did. I grew up in Roselle and his buildings were mostly in the northwest suburbs. And he still has the majority of them? or He sold the vast majority out in 2007 and then in 2009 he bought some. Gotcha. So you grew up watching basically your dad be a landlord. Yeah. And I do it much differently than him, but yeah, I did. Yeah. And and so uh, at what, what year did you get your broker license? So I got my broker license in 2009 after the financial crisis. Uh, I was planning on getting buying more real estate. And at that point, I started pooling money from other traders that I knew and started a fund. Interesting. So t- tell me about how, how did you go about putting that fund together? It actually happened, um, I, it's not to segue somewhere else, but I, I, after college I became a trader at one of those exchanges that may no longer exist in a few years and uh, 
for 14 years out of college, I was a uh, options trader. So you wore the jacket. And wore the jacket. You were done, done by two o'clock. And right, and I took every bonus I had and bought apartment buildings. Smart. Um, and then throughout the years, a lot of friends are like uh, asking me how I was generating this additional income when the market was moving against us, and I explained it to them. And around the financial crisis and all this opportunity presented itself, a bunch of friends came to me and said, "Why don't you?" pool funds together and we'll start a fund and invest in real estate. It, you know, <clears throat> it's so interesting you mentioned that it seems like so many brokers who work with investors uh, at some point get in touch with traders who just seem to be cash heavy. They're risk averse because their whole career is, is pretty risk risk heavy and they um, and they love sort of guaranteed or, or somewhat guaranteed rate of return or a reliable rate of return and real estate uh, oftentimes can provide that. It is, for most traders, this is the lowest form of risk to offer take. Right. And um, long term, you know, as long as you secure your financing and you invest in the right areas, it's very low risk, very high return, and great reward. So you put a fund together, you had uh, co-colleagues or, or friends that were traders that were able to help uh, fund it, and then your role was to go out and, and find properties and That's put correct. deals together? I, so I would find the properties, I'd renovate them, rent them, and manage them. and I. For that, I took a 20% stake in the company. Super, very smart. Right. Uh, we started out in 2009 in Logan Square in Avondale. And obviously now it's a different neighborhood than it was back then. Buildings were trading for 80 to 150,000. Mm -hmm. Now, similar buildings are 350. Wow. These are all, we only buy projects. Sure. So sure. from that, uh, you know, we through, you know, at trial and error, we learned uh, to perfect kind of a system in how you purchase properties and how you maximize your return. Yeah. And I've created a great team for that too. So can you talk a little bit about the team and, and sort of how you guys do it today? Yeah, so um, I would say I still, I represent clients and this fund. So majority of my brokerage business is finding properties for investors, whether it be large or small, first time buyers. And I have a great attorney I work with at Cadillus, which also represented the banks. So it was a good relationship. Beyond that, we work with uh, Tyler Manick at Shane Banks. Banks with the zoning code for the city of Chicago. So when we look at a property, he gives his assessment, and generally we add value by changing the zoning on all these properties. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And nobody knows it more than him, I guess, because. Yeah, and then so, you know, every week we're sitting down with the alderman, getting their support. And it could be something as simple as, a person has a two flat with an illegal garden. When they go to sell it, the garden can have no value. It cannot be appraised for that. We'll go to the alderman and work out a deal where we can make that legal for a few thousand dollars or some concession you give to the community. And then you've added eighty to $100,000 in value to your property. That's amazing. And that's often the easiest one. Wow. Yeah. How, how, did you, how did you learn how to, how to do that? Uh, you know, uh, I started doing a lot of, bit, well, a lot of this business and then uh, Cadillus, the father, the senior, kind of uh, introduced me to Shane Banks and they said that you guys could work well together and do some bigger things. Wow. How do you find the properties today? I know we're jumping a bit, um, but how do you locate properties? So it's half, I get half I get phone calls or texts from random people. They'll literally see my name on the uh, construction permit and they'll call it. The other half is misrepresented listings on MLS. What is, what, can you give me an example of what, what is a misrepresented listing? So uh, I, I just put a contract together for a property at, I, I guess I can give the address, right? Sure. 3555 North Milwaukee, and it was listed as a like a commercial unit, commercial building, uh, but really it's a two flat with a commercial space, and it's also next to the alderman that I do a lot of work with, and we are going to get it rezoned to legal three fat very easily. Wow! And it was two hundred eighty thousand dollars. Wow! Yeah. So how, it, it so it's so that that's an MLS listing that yeah. you noticed was was categorized wrong. Or incorrectly, or had an opportunity to be recategorized, sure. um, and then when things aren't on the MLS, you, you mentioned you get phone calls occasionally. Um, are you sourcing properties other ways as well? Or? So I have I work with a bunch of builders who also send out flyers. Ah. Um, I don't particularly care to do that, uh, but if something something comes up that's interesting, I'll pursue it. But truthfully, that's probably like five percent of what we get. A lot of it's uh, you do a deal here, and then someone approaches you. Sure. Uh, I was building my own home on Roscoe in Roscoe Village, and this uh, elder, elderly gentleman came up to me and said, "I want to sell my home." So that's how we got our next project. He's at David and Roscoe. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is, it's interesting. So, so you and, and you know you had, you were telling me before uh, before we started recording about um, conversion properties. Yes, and and that I thought was particularly interesting. Can you talk a little bit about? Sure. That? So, it, it's a crazy thing when you when you buy it. I specifically talk about Roscovich and North Center because they have the marquee schools that everyone wants to be in. Mm-hmm. When you look at the homes there, they're trading at about three fifty to four fifty a square foot uh, new construction. But for some reason, the apartment buildings are trading at. 200 to 300 a square foot. Okay. So, and a lot of them are brick and masonry construction. They have really good bones. So, there's a huge advantage. Whereas, if you come in right now, you're going to buy a home, you're going to pay at least 1.4 in Roscoe Witch for a new home. I can find you a two flat for $600,000. And if we work well with our budget for around three to 400,000, we can renovate it. And you have a 4,000 square foot home. That's amazing. And w- yeah. what's the type of turnaround time on something like that? Truthfully, it's a year. Yeah. Uh, Anyone who does it quicker doesn't have a husband, wife, or family involved, but every process becomes a decision. And right, but uh, use a flipper probably six months. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and so you're and and you found that um, they're just brokers aren't as knowledgeable about these types of projects. No, I mean right now I we I in fact took a client to see a property in Bell and Roscoe that was under contract, and I, I saw the other agent with his client, and I talked to the listing agent and said, you know, we're going to present an offer because I know this deal's not going to go through. Sure enough, the deal got broken. She called me yesterday. It's, I heard what the agent was saying costs were, they're not realistic about mm-hmm. what things cost, you know, like foundations, excavation. And if you, if you haven't had any involvement or any experience around yeah, this. Yeah, why would you know? Right. right. And unfortunately then, uh, you know, a lot of realtors become out of their element and then maybe a client ends up in a situation they shouldn't be. And I've seen that with two or three K loans. A lot of people way, you know, scope of work nowhere near what really needed to be done especially in like logan square or pilsen most of those buildings have termite damage and the foundations are worthless wow so they see the low price and they think they can just clean it up and there's so much more involved wow and so you know on the investor side oh as far as finding investors to, to yeah. work with you know obviously with your history as a trader it, you had access to those those you know people who are in that industry but if if you were maybe not in that industry as a previous career, um, how, how would you go about finding people to help fund those uh, projects? So um, I, I've worked with a mortgage lender having a, like a seminar at a bar as far as getting clients. Uh, but truthfully, it was, you know, talking to people at events, I got a hedge fund that manages money for McKinsey and I'm now representing them in this particular business. Right. Sure. So it's... You have to get out there. It's a, unfortunately I'm not great at the whole social aspect of it, but that's kind of these people are at these events, and you know when they hear there's another way for them to make money that's so much less risky than the market. Your market's very high right now. They want to diversify. Sure, sure. And uh, you know our uh, Kale Realty's owner Nick Patterson, who you obviously you know, um, has always said finding money is actually not that difficult. It isn't the yeah. deals is the challenge, and if you can get the deal together, the money just kind of finds you. And, Nick is 100 percent right on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so where, where do you see um, the Chicago market headed for, for your particular niche, you know, in, in some of the, 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 develop, the projects that you guys work on? Do you see anything changing in the next few years? Or? So uh, well, if we can uh, spread off in two different ways. I, I, as far as the high-end uh, home market, I see that hit, we're at capacity and our inventory is high. So I would probably stay away from something like that uh, as far as with high-end condos, things like that. Apartment buildings, it's crazy because the prices are much higher, but when you look at cap rates, which is the uh, net return on a property, they've actually gotten better because the rents have gone up so much. Interesting. So if you can find a building in Logan Square, yeah. if you can find that building, there's a way we can renovate it and make money. Yeah, there. I've always heard uh, as far as finding some of those properties, uh, you know, getting creative with it, there's brokers that have... Basically, uh, you know, when, when one of those buildings puts a, an apartment for rent phone number, which may be the owner, you know, mom and dad, mom and pop own the building or, or some, you know, maybe it's a management company too, but just going, hey, are you the owner? Would you sell if I offered you X, Y, and Z? Um, there's a lot of creative ways to get in front of those people who aren't necessarily thinking, necess- you know, they haven't put it on the MLS, it's not for right. sale, but maybe they would if somebody approached them. Um, but, you know, then, that takes a little bit, a little bit of work to to, to, to do those things. But um, uh, so as far as the so so that was 
On the buy and hold side, um, what what challenges have you guys run into with uh, being? You know, you're also a property manager then as right, well. Right. Right. So I, do you do you find that does that eat up a lot of your time? Or? Property management. I've got a good team with me, so they handle most of that. Uh, as far as rentals go, we have great agents that rent the apartments. I don't do any of that. It's very sure. time consuming. Uh, honestly, our biggest problem is construction timelines, permits, sure. and the building department. Sure. So the city obviously is inundated with new permits and construction. We, it's always you know boom or bust here, right? Sure. So we have a dangerous amount of apartments coming online downtown. Whereas in, I always cite North Center and Logan Square because those are very active areas. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is a lot, especially in these two neighborhoods, seeing a lot of places being sold that were two flats and three flats and being turned into single family homes. So with the exception of some of the Centrum properties that are near the TOD projects, mm -hmm. uh, there's a real deficiency in housing that's okay. happening. That's interesting. So it's a real need for, for... Right. And they thought the TOD zoning, if, I don't know if the listeners are familiar with that, the transit-oriented development, allowing them to build these large buildings near all stations where you wouldn't need parking, would pick up the slack. It's helping uh, in Logan Square in Cal on California and Milwaukee, they built those two towers. But that's, again, a different price point. In these neighborhoods, kind of on the brown line, you're not really seeing that much of that, except for Old Town. And then the one at uh, Roscoe and Lincoln. Gotcha. And you really pretty much hyper focus in just a few neighborhoods. I do. Um, there, you know, I like everyone else. I was, I was, um, I was pulled to the high returns of certain areas that really weren't there, and I learned a life lesson very early on. So, which is which? Uh, uh, paper paper numbers aren't realistic. You have to look at the neighborhood vacancy rates and other factors before you, you know, can assess if it's a profitable investment or not. Yeah, that's a good point. In fact, that brings it to, to another uh, question about, you know, it, it, as a broker who's maybe servicing the more traditional uh, home buyer sure. and, um, you know, who is, wants to get more acclimated to investment uh, sort of um, valuation or just sort of how to go about learning, what, what would you recommend? Are there resources that you, you feel would be helpful to someone who's new? So. Uh a great way to figure out what a building could be worth is a website, uh, rentometer.com, and it's free, and it'll give you the immediate rents of an area based on the size of the unit. Oh, so you can yeah. figure out the cap rate pretty yeah. relatively easily. Because a lot of these old buildings are like, my dad's even guilty of this too. He's had tenants for 15 years. Maybe he hasn't raised rent right. to market. So you can see that maybe this should be a $600 apartment. It should be a $1,400 apartment. Then you can kind of assess what the value could be if you got in there Put a fresh coat of paint on a new kitchen and bathroom. Sure. So you so you you would go to that site. You see that rents are lower than they ought to be, and then what do you do from there? Then you approach the owner and yeah, you make an offer. Sure. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of things you until you open up a wall, you don't know. And I had a client. It was actually the first sale I ever made. It was a, a very large building in Avondale. And he opened the walls up and they literally disintegrated. Oh, no. So there was no sign of termites in the inspection. He even had a termite inspection. But, you know, so a simple project ended up becoming this huge ordeal. So he actually looked at it as an opportunity to make it a much bigger building. Sure. And in the end, it worked out. But, I mean, it's a scary thing, right? Sure, sure. So you don't, I mean, you don't ever really know unless, you know, you open up the walls. That being said, if I ever look at a building, I go to the basement first. The basement can tell the whole story about a building. If it's clean, you don't see signs of water or crack in the foundation, that's a good sign. Yeah, if the walls haven't been painted over to hide the mold or... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I, I have a friend that happened to, bought a very expensive home, and yeah. uh, the, the previous owners had literally painted the, the basement walls to, to hide the mold. Um, and I, I imagine you're uh, active, or at least have been active on bigger pockets as a dot com. I don't know if that's. A, I have not. You're not. Yeah, I, I was just going to reference this as a, as a resource for its. Um, if you're not familiar, it's a. Yeah. Yeah, it's a large. I think it's the largest online forum for investors who want to chat back and forth. Uh, real estate investors, of course, and it's it's like maybe a hundred bucks a year. It's totally worth it. Okay. Uh, and it's it's just a great place to get information. You you wouldn't need to go there for learning about investing. Sure, but it's but always nice to bounce your ideas off someone else. It's too. it's interesting, yeah, and they and they do have actively, you know, people trade properties on there. So it's pretty really? it's, it's yeah, you should check it out. Bigger pockets. It's <laughs> uh, 
It's, uh, it's, it's very cool. I've actually tried to reach out to them to, to do, because they do their own podcast as well, which is great. Uh, but I've tried to reach out to them to, to do for, for this, and I haven't been able to, to successfully reach them, but they, they are awesome. Um, they have tens of thousands of investors who are just chatting. It's just a big forum. It's basically like a gigantic online forum, and they keep it really well moderated, so it's not like a broker necessarily couldn't go on there and say, hey, if anyone needs a realtor, give me a call. Like, right. They won't let that happen. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's particularly interesting. But anyway... Um, uh, any other resources you've been using recently to figure out, you know, investment opportunities? Um, I'm trying to think. Like, are you a co-star or a LoopNet guy, or? So, I've used LoopNet in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't really currently. Yeah. A lot of stuff I see on LoopNet is kind of priced high. People put it on there because it's it's kind of a passive aggressive way of marketing your property. Sure. And people, if someone bites, sure. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, uh, it seems like especially these bigger buildings, they seem to be pocket listings. Yeah. And you kind of have to know the guys that are dealing in the areas. Gotcha. So, so what would you say? Do you have any? Um, are, are you? Have you pivoted your business at all? Uh, you know, in the last year, has anything changed, or just so steady we're as you uh, guys? obviously as prices uh, as neighborhoods mature, we have to move on. So, uh, yeah, are you thinking of other neighborhoods or we? we so we follow Milwaukee Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously uh, Logan Square has kind of matured. Uh, Avondale has matured, so now we're at Portage Park. Gotcha. Uh, you know, Old Irving. And yeah. it's a great community and it's, it's growing. And also we are west on north, which I thought I would never do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, up to 3,000 west. Sure. Uh, that being said, there's there's nothing wrong with going further from these borders. It's, it just depends on what you're looking for. And this is just a selfish question because I used to live there. I, lived, I had a condo in Uptown for okay. like 11 years. And that's a particularly interesting neighborhood. You, you probably, I don't know how much you've ever looked into it, but I know it's been around where, where you grew up. And, and So our lawyer, yeah. uh, our zoning lawyer is doing a 200 unit building in uptown. Okay. And I, I've had issues, we're, we're doing some developments in the West Loop. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alderman, Alderman Burnett is a great guy. Uh, we have to get the blessing of all the community groups in these neighborhoods where we can do a project. Sure. And there, there's like two or three. Uh, in Uptown, there's 42. Right. So, my experience from people who I know who have invested there, it's, it's very challenging to yeah. make everyone happy. Yes. And these aldermen are winning these elections by like one or two votes, so they will not cross anyone. Yeah. So, how, how do you deal then with, with aldermen when you're having to navigate those political waters? So, we're lucky in that a lot of times they want us to use their contractors, and our feeling is if they're a better bid, I'll use anyone. Sure. Um, but generally, we're trying to we're trying to add units to the community. You're trying to add value, yeah. right? So usually, adding a unit overall is going to help reduce the cost of living. So they kind of support that thing. When, I'm pretty shocked at the resistance in Uptown. I can I can see that part of the problem is the new rents are probably double what the old rents were, but they are also quadrupling the amount of units there. Yeah. It's finally um, maybe finally starting to mature. Yeah, up. that is. I'll, I'll say personally, that's one neighborhood I avoid. Yeah, just it's tricky. It's yes. Yeah, and if you, uh, it's for the big boys because it takes a lot of money to pay these lawyers to you know fight these battles for you. Well, I very much appreciate your time. I think this has been extremely helpful and uh, probably one of the most unique uh, interviews we'll, we'll, I will have done on this podcast. So I really appreciate it. And um, if if anyone's interested in learning, in contacting you, maybe sure. they have an opportunity for you, how would they get in touch with you? Sure, just email me at M-I-T-I-R-P-A-T-E-L at gmail.com and I'll try to respond as quick as I can. All right, well, thanks, Material. Really appreciate it. Thank you, DJ. Thanks. Enjoy the whole weekend.